All right. Um, so everyone has returned by now from their breakout rooms. Hopefully you were able to learn um, interesting facts about each other. Okay, so I'm just gonna go around. Um, just I'm just gonna call on someone randomly from each breakout room, okay? Um, this will be fun. All right, so from room one, um, Sophia. There's a Sophia and a Sophie from room one. <laughs> it is. Um, so two interesting facts about two people. So Sophie's mom is from the Netherlands, and so she speaks Dutch at home. And um, for Michelle, she got a cat two weeks ago. And then I'll just throw in another fun fact. So Grace um, is not a huge basketball fan, but this one year she made a March Madness bracket that actually ended up being 23rd in the world, which I think is super, super fun and cool. But yeah, yeah, that is cool. I mean, what are the odds of that? I mean, very small. <laughs> I had to guess. All right, fantastic, fun. All right, so room number two, I'm gonna call on Megan. Yes, so um, in our room, um, so Jack is on the football team and qualified for state powerlifting in high school, which is pretty cool. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to see who else was in our room. Oh, Shreya um, is in an off-campus apartment in New Haven. And um, her favorite fast food is the Taco Bell Chalupa, which is kind of controversial. Um, although I think like from Taco Bell, it's a pretty good choice. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, I think that's, that's, that's our two. Yeah, you only had to do two, um, great. Um, all right, room three, I'm going to call on uh, Princess. Um, so Sebastian likes honey mustard and Chick-fil-A sauce, and um, Maureen likes to serve. Nice. All right. Thank you for that. Um, room four, I'm going to call on Eleanor. Okay, so um, Shreya really likes sleeping and eating. I think that's correct, sleeping and eating. And Madeline really likes makeup and theater. Cool. Yay. Nice. So we have two Shreyas. Cool. All right. Good to know. Um, room five. I'm going to call on, let's see, how about um, Peyton? Um, yeah. So Jenny um, is doing chem research. Um, and then uh, Leah is. Um, she like plays the bells in Harkness Towers. I thought that was really funny. Oh, cool. Nice. All right. Room six, I'll call on Jed. Sure, sure. We have some heavy hitters in our group. Uh, so Ryan is perfect pitch. And Michelle knows four languages, Spanish, Japanese, Italian, and Portuguese. Nice. Wow, that is, that is hard to compete with. <laughs> Um, all right, room seven, I'll call on Becca. Okay, so um, Malia hates asparagus, which I thought was interesting. I, I may resonate with that. Um, and Anna collects fossils, which is really cool. Nice, great. Wow, you guys are very interesting people. Um, <laughs> all right, awesome. Well, thank you for participating in that. It's fun um, to do something like that in a, you know, since we can't get together in person and um, meet each other in person. So um, I thought that was a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Okay, so hopefully I'm still sharing my screen, right? You can see my screen. Okay, cool. Um, so that's breakout room activity number one. We'll have one more later, which is why I gave you that um, link. So make sure you access that link and have it ready um, for our next breakout room activity. All right, um, let's see. Yep, this is where we are. Um, so these are the learning goals. So I'll typically have a slide like this at the start of, or near the start. We are um, definitely not at the start now of this lecture. Um, so the goal for today is to understand what development is, to understand what genetics is and to begin to understand how these processes are studied. But quite frankly, given the time, I think it's more likely that we'll get to number three tomorrow, okay? All right, so here's breakout room activity two. So you're about to go to the same breakout rooms with the same people that you were just in. 
Um, and we're just going to talk a little bit about what does development, developmental biology mean to you, right? So if you were to define developmental biology, how would you define it? Okay. Um, and so that link that I gave you is, um, well, is a link to a set of Google slides um, where you can write down your responses um, from your breakout room, okay? So uh, you'll type out your responses into those slides depending on which breakout room you are, right? You can figure out which breakout room you are in. Um, I believe it tells you when I send you there. Um, and just make sure to have a representative um, that you've elected that will um, share what your group, how your group defines developmental biology when you come back, okay? All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna give you two minutes. It's gonna be really quick, all right? So I'm sending you to all those rooms now. Oh, let's see here. Jim, how do I pronounce your name? Yeah, Mark? Jamart. Yeah, oh. sorry, I'm just joining. I just got back from my doctor's appointment. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, so I'm fortunately I'm recording. The beginning of this has been recorded, so you can rewatch whatever I have said. Nothing too important yet, actually. <laughs> but let me assign you to a room. Um, so let's see. I'm going to assign you to room number one. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm marked down on the attendance sheet cool. uh, that he had come in late. Yeah, that's fine. You know, something like that. It's yeah, I didn't realize it was a doctor's appointment. Until it's like, you know, first lecture. I haven't really gone into logistics or expectations yet. So we're good. I have just I have just booked a laptop to borrow for the next <laughs> three weeks. So yeah. Nice. What, how did you do that? Um, Yale actually will, uh, like just through the Yale library system, they have laptops that you can loan for like up to a month. So nice. I just reserved one. Um, I'll go pick it up after the lecture. <laughs> That's a yeah, this is a really, this is a really unfortunate time for my laptop to uh, decide it didn't want to function anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a relief. <laughs> Actually, when I first started, um, for, first started this yeah. job, my computer my computer crashed. It like died, so I had to get a new computer. But out of all the times that it could have died, that was probably the best because I was done with my grad school. Like I had submitted, I'd been published. Now I'm starting a new job, so it's like I didn't lose anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, heartbreaking when it happens. Yeah, for me, it's like I, um, I, my computer's been deteriorating for a while. So I knew that at some point I, I was like planning to get a new computer anyway, but I applied for an F31 like grant, right? And that comes with technology money. So I'll find out in August if I got the grant. So I was like, okay, if I can just like hold out until, until I like find out whether I got this grant or not, and then I can use the grant money to buy a new computer. But uh, it decided to give out two months too early. <laughs> Teresa, do you know about the Dean's Emergency Fund? Uh, no. So. Uh, my, I was being an idiot and literally dumped a glass of water on my laptop in like January. And the cost to repair all of it was like $1,400, which was like a new MacBook basically. So I submitted yeah. that quote to Yale. There's like a person, it's not Richard Slight anymore because there's a new Dean, but basically you email yeah. someone and say like, here's the cost estimate to repair my laptop. And they will like usually give you the money for the repair. And then if you want to put it towards a new laptop, they'll just let you do that. They don't like ask any questions. They just cut you a check. Wow. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so you should, nice. do I'll send you a link about it because I literally was just like, I'm screwed. I can't afford, you know, $1,500 <laughs> like repair right now. Oh yes, please, please send that to me. <laughs> Hang on, let me find it. Yeah. That's great. When I was in, I, I had a MacBook. Um, when I was an undergrad, I had a MacBook, and a, a friend of mine accidentally spilt a bottle of wine on it. Um, and then I had to get it repaired. And 
uh apple care was originally like oh like we're not going to cover it because it's like liquid damage but i think somewhere in the bureaucracy they forgot that it was liquid damage and then apple care covered it and i was like i'm just going to take the laptop and run before they notice that they were not supposed to cover this repair <laughs> yeah that's lucky <laughs> Um, okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and bring everyone back. All right, reorganize my windows. All right, I think everyone's back now. Um, okay, so I've stopped sharing my screen. Hopefully we can all just look at our individual screens where we have pulled up the slides, right? Everyone should have a link to that. And so that's what we're all looking at now. For the sake of time, I won't go through all seven rooms. I'm just gonna call on two rooms, okay? Um, to tell us a little bit about what their group decided developmental biology is. So I'm going to start with group number two, because you have a lot written down. So I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> so group number two, your representative, you can tell us what your group, um, how your group defines developmental biology. Hopefully you had time to get a representative. Did you guys decide? <laughs> no, but I think we just all kind no, of- No, we did not. Yeah, what, what we thought. Okay, uh, yeah, could could you go through that? Who's speaking right now? Um, uh, my, my can, really can, is. Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I'll take like a little bit um, and then someone else can can take it from me. Um, but we sort of wrote down what we had learned prior. Um, I guess we got like a pretty good background in the initial biology that was the prerequisite for this one. So um, making sure that when we thought as a group that it was changes that organisms go through from the initial stages of life through full adult maturation. There was some debate over whether it was like the time you were born or like hatched or whatever the organism in question does, um, or it was like a sort of like mature adulthood. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Technically it's throughout your life. So any changes in form and function uh, to your body even after birth is a part of development, right? So you're, you're born as a, a baby, but, but you develop into a toddler and you develop into an adolescent and then you develop into an adult. And if you're a female, right, as an adult, you can go through pregnancy, you can go through menopause. These are all sorts of changes to your body that are, that are form and function. Um, so that is related to development, right? Um, ultimately what's happening is you have, you know, changes in gene expression at certain times of your life. Um, and the effects of that are changes in form and function, um, appropriate for that life stage. So we can see that in humans and we can see that for all, for all types of organisms. So that's great. That's a, that's a great point that you made. <laughs> any, other, any other things you want to add to that group too? Okay, and I'm gonna just call on a random group here. Um, how about um, how about group number six? Yeah, so we kind of touched on a lot of the a lot of similar ideas, right? Just every every kind of change that that is happening is due to something kind of developing. Um, specifically noted that 
Um, it encompasses the study of embryonic development and how it relates to evolutionary changes, um, all types of cell differentiation, um, I don't know, things like, like neurogenesis, for example, um, and then the maturation and expression of various phenotypes. And then lastly, we kind of touched on how uh, environmental factors can affect growth, uh, kind of like epigenetics. Yeah, that's really, that's great. I'm glad you brought up epigenetics. That's something we will definitely touch on in the genetics portion. Um, so, yep, that's that's definitely a way to control um, gene expression, which ultimately can control phenotypes that we see. And if you, if you aren't familiar with the term epigenetics, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't stress out too much yet. If you don't, if you don't understand the difference between genetics and phenotype or genotype and phenotype, that's fine. We will, we will go through that too, right? This is just all putting our thoughts down here. Um, so we have a number of slides here with, with definitions. I'll read through these later, um, but it's, it's really nice to see your, what you think developmental biology is. Much of it, very correct. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna share my screen again. So give me a moment to do that. Always takes a moment to hit all the buttons. All right, so you should now see my screen again. This is the next slide here. Okay, so thank you all for contributing to um, a definition of developmental biology. Um, so if you if you look at the Sadava text, um, which is uh, our text for this course, it's um, for my portion, it's not necessarily required. It just supplements what I'm telling you in the lecture, okay? Um, and you'll actually see that I have um, a version of it, um, of the full text, it's a secret, okay, it's on the canvas. So if you can't get it in time, two and a half weeks is very short. So if you haven't been able to get the text yet, um, it's actually on our canvas, okay, but don't tell anyone. Okay, so if you look at the text, you'll see that um, they define developmental biology as the process by which multicellular organisms beginning with a single cell go through a series of changes taking on successive forms that characterize its life cycle. Okay, so that's kind of a long definition. Um, so here, um, let's sh let, let me show you what that means. Okay, so here what, I, what I'm showing is a video of some static images of a developing human embryo. Okay, so you can see once it starts, oh, there it goes. Um, you can see each successive stage. Um, right, there's this change in the form of the embryo as it grows and develops. And this video is showing from uh, what we call Carnegie stage 11, which is here, right in the picture on the right, to Carnegie stage 23. Um, and this is named after the institute, I guess, that, that acquired these images. Um, back in the early 1900s, I suppose, um, the Carnegie Institute. Um, so after this point, after Carnegie stage 23, which I believe <clears throat> is around week eight, week eight of embryonic development, um, that is now you, you're transitioning from the embryonic stage to the fetal stage. So that's probably why they don't have pictures after that here, at least in this set. Okay, so after this Carnegie stage 23, um, development is considered to be fetal rather than embryonic for the remainder of pregnancy, okay? Um, and this, these stages are all based on morphology, right? So hopefully you can see the morphological changes that are happening from stage, or the morphological changes that are happening from stage to stage, right? Um, so that is, that is development, right? This is showing early stages of human development. Um, Importantly, even before any of these shown changes here, so even before stage 11, so if I play this again, right, um, that's, um, that's many cells there already, right? Um, but we, before this, we all start from a single cell and, and that cell becomes two and those cells become four and those four become eight and so on and so forth until you have an organism in the case of a human, which is made up of trillions of cells. And 
as I said before, this organism can continue to grow and develop, not just during embryonic development, but even throughout life after birth, right? Um, and so, but that's growth and development, right? The series of changes that happen um, and, and each one in a defined order converting from one form to another, each of these forms sort of characterizing a different life stage, right, of the life cycle. So often as developmental biologists, um, uh, we say that developmental biology is the study of changes in form and function of an organism over time. And we often say that developmental biology is the study of development over four dimensions. So that's three-dimensional space and time, time being the fourth dimension. Um, so, right, importantly, um, in order to construct a multicellular organism, you need a lot of specialization, right? Not only do you need a lot of cells, but you need a lot of specialization of those cells that you produce, okay? So here, if you came from um, 105 with Professor Musiker, you probably heard about the intestinal epithelium. Um, so, right, but we know that we have organ systems within our body. These organ systems are composed of organs. And if we, so for example, if we think about the entire digestive system as this slide is showing here, where you start off with, you have your stomach, um, you have your small and large intestine. All of these are organs that are coordinated into an organ system to accomplish the function of digesting food, right? And disposing of that food. Um, and all of these organs are composed of tissues, right? So that's another level underneath organs. And all of these tissues, so the level underneath tissues, they're all composed of cells. Um, so what this slide is emphasizing here is this hierarchy of cells um, make up tissues, tissues make up organs, organs make up organ systems. And importantly, um, this term here that I brought up before, differentiated, right? Cells are specialized or differentiated for certain functions, meaning these cells have very specific functions, okay? Um, and we call these cells differentiated. They have a specialized form and function. Um, these specialized cells will then group together into tissues and into organs and then into organ systems, okay? Um, so this is just uh, summarizing what I just said here, right? Cells are specialized for certain functions. They're organized into tissues. Tissues are organized into organs. Organs are organized into organ systems, right? Um, so uh, here I have in red a question for you to think about. Um, we won't answer it in class. So this is what I'll call a professor challenges the class or a PCC question. Um, so if you go on to Ed, if you feel like answering this question, I would love it if you would. Um, but what about unicellular organisms, right? We know that on earth there's plenty of unicellular organisms. Um, they do not have this hierarchical, hierarchical structure, obviously, because they're only one cell. Um, but do they require different cell types or different cell fates throughout their life? Um, what do you guys think about that? So if you're interested in answering that, you can. Um, we have this platform called Ed Discussions, which I opened up. Hopefully you can see it on the canvas now. It'll be one of those tabs on the left-hand side and you'll be able to see, I've already started a thread with this question and you can answer it um, or respond to it with your thoughts on it. Okay, so continuing on, we've looked at human differentiation. Um, here is another organism here um, uh, showing another example of differences in form and function over time. Um, so this is, I'm going to about to show you a video here of the developmental life cycle of uh, this African clawed frog, right, also known as Xenopus, right? So this is often um, a, a uh, organism that we study in developmental biology. So you'll hear more about the Xenopus as we go through this course. Um, so here on the right, I'm about to show you a video of um, 
this developmental timeline going from an unfertilized egg, it gets fertilized, or maybe it starts right at fertilization, I can't remember. Um, and then it begins, which then begins the developmental process um, to the point that it becomes a tadpole, which is really only a couple of days later, if I remember correctly. So from egg to tadpole, it takes about three days. Obviously this video is sped up for 35 seconds. Okay, so what um, we're gonna watch this video here and while you're watching it, I'm gonna play it twice. Um, I'd like you to write down two observations while watching it. So what do you observe? What do you see happening here? Okay, so I'm gonna play it twice. Let me make sure it's muted. And it always takes a moment. It's thinking, it's thinking about it. I hope it plays. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna play that one more time. So make sure uh, you're, you make two observations. All right, so what do you guys observe? What's happening here? Any volunteers, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, the cells kind of like when they're replicating, they look like they're bubbling off of one another because well, they are, I guess. Um, and then I noticed um, they replicate until you can't really see the divisions between the cells anymore. And then they condense into kind of like a crescent shape. Um, which is interesting because you know they're still dividing, but they almost look like, I mean, they're taking up less room while still multiplying, if that makes sense. Yep, that's exactly right. So you bring up two important observations. You see some cell division, right? You, you There's a lot of cell division going on here. And that's important because you're going from a single cell that's fertilized, initiating development. And during the process of development, the organism will need to grow and expand. And as it grows, it needs more cells, it needs a lot of cells, right? So you need to make more cells and cells are born from other cells. That's the process of mitosis, right? Cell division. Um, so great, that's one observation. Um, you also brought up, um, it's very observant, the just like, it seems like some cells are disappearing, right? It appears like some cells are disappearing and that's because, you know, the, the embryo itself is not growing, um, but at this brief stage in development, right, you have a lot of cell division that's happening in this small space that's also not growing. So the cells are getting smaller and smaller, right? It's this confinement of space at this early stage. So you, it, you, you know, the separation between cells starts to become less and less apparent as you get more and more cells there. Eventually, as we see with this tadpole, um, this organism will escape this sort of sac here um, at this point, it's going to be able to grow more and take up more space, right? But during this brief stage in the first three days of development, you're right, it does, it, you know, you have all the cell division in this space that's not getting larger itself, which means that the cells are getting smaller at that stage. That's great. Okay, any other observations that people made? 
Um, you start. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I think you can start to see the formation of like bodily axes. I think there's like right left symmetry. And then you also see some specialization of cells where there's now more of like a head portion, more of a tail portion. And I think the orientation of how the organism knows what's left, what's right, where to put like symmetry is really interesting. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So we call that like this asymmetry of polarity. So during differentiation, you have the, the, the formation of these axes. We'll talk about this more, right? So that you have a head forming on one side of the organism and a tail forming on the other side, right? Something needs to be directing this. Um, and we'll talk about that so that the organism knows the difference between where to form a head versus where to form a tail, where to form the eyes, right? You need, an, you need some sort of uh, developmental axes for that. And then, yes, I love how you said, I think you said differentiation, right? Or some sort of specialization. So, right, for example, we see tail and eyes forming here at the end of this video. Um, so after you have enough cells, you start to see, you know, the, you know, certain tissues and organs of different function start to appear, right? And that's, that's due to this um, specialization that is happening, this process called differentiation. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving on here, right? So here are some really fascinating questions that we will not be able to talk about now um, in regards to developmental biology, right? So one being, how does one fertilized egg give rise to a multicellular organism? I'm gonna focus in on that question. Um, and you can read through the rest of these on your own, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna focus in on that first question there. Okay, so how does one fertilized egg give rise to a multicellular organism? That's a huge question on its own, right? So how, how is it that once a sperm and egg cell meet fuse together, they combine their DNA, their halves of DNA to make up a whole complete set um, in which you have cop two copies of every gene. We'll review all of this later, by the way. Um, but how does that one fertilized egg um, become this uh, golden hamster, for example, um, this multicellular organism? Um, and right, while this hamster might be small and cute, it's it's a complex multicellular organism after all, right? So um, and by the way, these are obviously not uh, to scale, right? Um, just FYI. Okay, so to continue answering this question, right? We've talked about cell division and cell fate determination, right? So in order to construct a multicellular hamster from a fertilized egg, you need different organs, right? You need a liver, you need a heart, you need lungs, you need brain, you need eyes, stomach. Um, these are all important. Uh, for the formation of this hamster. Obviously from there, you need different tissues, which are composed of different cells. And you need a lot of those cells to make a tissue. So the first problem is, is you need to have a lot of cells. So that's cell division. So cell division is happening, right? You go from one cell, you make two cells, from two cells, you make four and so on and so forth. Okay, but importantly, you also need different kinds of cells um, with different identities. Um, and we call these cell fates. So uh, another important subsequent question that we can, that we will consider in this course is um, how do the early cell types of the embryo immediately after fertilization, these, these early cell types, which have this great potential, something we refer to as potency, such as the embryonic stem cell, how do these very potent cells become these very specialized cell types of the body, right? Such as blood, such as liver or intestinal cells. Um, we need all of these cell types to make the body, right? So how is that, how is that determined, right? Oh, I, I actually saw a hand up. Is that hand up been up for a while or is that a new hand? No, that, that was new. I just had a quick question. Go ahead. Um, can you just clarify what you mean by potent? Mm. We will go into this more, but potent meaning if you take, if you were to take, you know, uh, an, an embryonic stem cell, right? That cell has the potential. And I think this will become clearer after we answer this question here. That cell has the potential to become any cell type of the body, 
it can become a blood cell. It can become a muscle cell. It can become a hair follicle cell. It can become a neuron um, if given the right cues. Um, and so during development, what's happening is that these different cells are receiving different cues. And the result of that is the answer to this question. So maybe we should go ahead and answer this question. Um, but it, the fact is, is that every cell in your body um, has the information to become any other cell type in the body, right? So your blood cells have the same genetic material as your muscle cells, but yet your blood cell has a blood cell fate and your muscle cells have a muscle cell fate, right? So how is that, right? Um, so that's the answer to this question. And we'll define potency and talk more about potency um, in subsequent lectures, but that's a really great question. I hope for now that was, that made enough sense. Okay. All right, so, um, right, so going on to this question here. So like I just said, what if I told you, okay, the human body is made up of, um, you know, and I don't know if this number is correct, at least on the order of trillions of cells, um, of about 200 different types. Um, but all of these cells have essentially the same sequence of DNA. And, and from previous courses, you should know what DNA is, right? So could you think of one or two ways that this multicellular organism with all these different cell types might achieve this feat? Um through different methods of gene regulation and gene expression. Like we talked about epigenetics. So especially like in cell fate, there will be some genes that are more methylated um, so that it makes it unlikely that that particular cell will ever express that gene. Um, and it can, but you know, it's, it, you have to like un, um, demethylate it. And so it's harder um, or other, there are other forms like along the pathway of gene regulation, but for this purpose, like the um, methylation and epigenetics are the most common, I think. Yes. So you're absolutely right. So in short, we're talking about differential gene expression. And the way to have differential gene expression is through different mechanisms of regulation, methylation being one of those things, epigen epigenetics being one of those things, right? We'll talk all about that later, about the different mechanisms by which you can have differential gene expression. But right? The answer is, is that you have differential gene expression. Okay. So you have one portion of your developing organism turning into the head region of an animal rather than turning into a tail region, right? Into some other identity. Um, and right. It's because the certain cells in those regions are expressing certain genes at that time um, to then make a head or to then make a tail, right? So if that doesn't make sense yet, let me just go into an example here. So for example, let's consider this protein here that you may have heard of before in the 101 portion. Um, hemoglobin is a, typically a, a popular protein to talk about in 101 um, because it has this interesting uh, structure here that I'm showing. Um, so does anyone know what hemoglobin does? What is the function of hemoglobin? It binds oxygen on red blood cells. Right, exactly. So it's made by the red blood cells so that it can transport oxygen throughout the body, right? So your, your blood cells, your red blood cells produce a lot of this hemoglobin, um, which means that they're expressing a lot of this hemoglobin gene, right? So recall the, the central dogma of molecular biology. You have a gene that's transcribed into RNA, which is translated into protein, right? So you have this hemoglobin gene, um, which is in all the cells of the body, but for whatever reason, your red, not for whatever reason, there is a reason, your red blood cells are going to express a lot of it, okay? So they're gonna make, a, they're gonna produce a lot of this hemoglobin protein. Okay, so the point is here, is that um, all the cells in your body have the hemoglobin gene somewhere in their genome, but not all the cells of the body will express it, right? Your red blood cells express and produce a lot of this hemoglobin protein. Okay, so this is an example of differential gene expression. 
Um, so right again, while our cells have a full set of genes, um, they're only expressing some of them at any given point in time, right? And, and that's an efficient system. You don't want to be wasteful and have nerve cells um, making a liver cell proteins, right? And the way that this happens is via regulation. And we'll talk about some of those mechanisms of regulation. But what this means is that genes can be turned on and off like a light switch. And um, so here in, in, this, in this diagram here, we have three different types of cells. The expression of four types of genes are here. Uh, we have something called housekeeping genes, which are expressed in all three of these cells here, red blood cells, muscles, and pancreatic cells. Um, insulin, which is only expressed in the pancreatic cells, hemoglobin, which is only expressed in the red blood cells, myosin, which is only expressed in the muscle cells, right? And so we can appreciate just from this picture here, the different shapes that these cells take. Um, obviously there are different functions that they have. And this is all a result of the different genes that they are expressing and thus the different proteins that they're producing, right? Um, so what is a housekeeping gene? Like a regulatory gene? Yeah, so yeah, something important just for the survival of that cell, um, right? It could be involved in metabolism, right? It's just some, some there's a set of genes that we refer, refer to as housekeeping genes. And these are just important for that cell to function. So. Um, there's going to be a subset of genes that overlap between different cell types, no matter what. But then there's going to be this other subset of, of genes like hemoglobin, insulin, and myosin that aren't going to be expressed in every single cell because they're not needed in every single cell. Okay, so it's 11.45, so I'm trying to gauge my time here. Um, and I'd like to, um, I think I'm going to skip this slide for now. The analogy that I'm making here is that um, DNA, right? You might have heard um, that DNA is life's blueprint. That's not exactly right, right? Because a blueprint would give you like this complete description of what the final organism is going to look like, right? Um, but that's not the case, right? Instead, what DNA is doing is it's giving a sort of in set of instructions, a program for how development should take place, right? So this is, this is a popular analogy here that, um, right, that DNA is sort of like origami or this paper folding, right? From, from this paper crane here, um, it's really hard to describe how to make the paper crane. What's more informative is this, this set of folding instructions here on how to make that paper crane. Okay, so DNA is, is a recipe coding for thousands of different proteins. All these proteins interact with each other. They interact with the environment, just like ingredients um, in whatever you're baking, right? Just like in a cake. Okay, so skipping that slide a little bit um, here, just a review of the central dogma of molecular biology, what I, which I mentioned before, right? So here, looking at this cartoon diagram, you have a eukaryotic cell here on the left, and we see this, we see a membrane-bound nucleus. It's containing some DNA here. Um, DNA in the cell doesn't actually look like this, right? As you covered before, I hope. Um, it's actually very compact in a structure that looks sort of like this in chromatin. Um, and we'll talk about that later too. At some point, it's very coiled up, but at some point it'll be uncoiled and you'll have an enzyme called RNA polymerase come in and transcribe this DNA into RNA. Um, and this RNA will then go out into the cytoplasm and be translated by um, a ribosome into a protein, which is made up of amino acids. Okay, so all of that should, should sound pretty familiar, right? Um, and so we already talked a lot about what development means. Um, now I'm starting to talk about genetics. I'm starting to talk about DNA and genes. 
Um, so now we're entering the realm of genetics. Um, and hopefully what will become apparent after this lecture is that genetics and development go hand in hand. Um, genetics is the study of genes and their, their hereditary processes of how these genes are passed on um, from generation to generation. Um, so DNA right here, we should all be familiar at this point with how um, DNA is made up of these four nucleotides. So you have A's, C's, uh, G's, and T's, um, and, and they're strung together in a sequence, and that makes up the sequence of the DNA. And you'll have regions um, which are called a gene. And a gene is a segment of the DNA that contains information for making a protein, okay? So now here on this slide, I have some key vocabulary um, that you should have in your repertoire by now. I'm just reviewing them, um, right? You first, you have DNA, which is the molecule that's responsible for passing information from parent to daughter cells, um, and they're made up of nucleotides. And it's important to note that on occasion, you can have mutations to this DNA sequence. Um, and those mutations in the DNA sequence eventually could potentially result in a uh, change to the amino acid sequence, right? That's, that's the central dogma. Um, and if we have a different amino acid sequence, we could actually alter the structure of that protein. And so, as you know, from previous courses, hopefully 101, the structure of a protein determines its function. So if you alter the sequence of a, of a molecule due to a mutation, you could potentially alter its structure, which could then alter its function, right? So that's why sometimes mutations can result in molecules that do not behave as they normally would uh, when they weren't mutated, right? Mutations will definitely be something we talk about more um, later on. Okay, this term genome, what does that mean? It's um, an organism's genome is the sum total of all DNA in a cell of that organism. So all the cells in a multicellular organism, for the most part, all those cells contain the same genome. They all contain the same genes um, and they're, they're uh, almost essentially the same sequence of DNA unless a mutation occurred, right? When I use the term gene, that's in reference to a specific segment of that DNA um, that, that is converted into a protein product, right? Because again, the central dogma, the gene gets transcribed into RNA, that RNA gets translated into protein. Um, so these are segments of the DNA that um, encode a protein. There are portions of the DNA, actually quite a bit of our DNA that do not encode a protein, right? So there's only a portion of our genome that actually has um, a made up of genes. Okay, so a subtle distinction there. Um, all right, and all of this is important because at the heart of development um, is the fact that one cell gives rise to so many different cell types. It's because there's this differential control of different genes being expressed at different times during the process of development and that's how you give rise to all these different cellular identities. Um, so genetics and development, those two concepts are heavily intertwined. And, and to put that simply, it's just that genes control development. Genes control development by determining where and when proteins are synthesized. And obviously many thousands of genes are involved in the, in the entire process. Um, but the expression of each of these genes is under tight control and they are tightly regulated to ensure that they are switched on only at the right time and only at the right place. Okay, so if you walk away from this course having learned only one thing, that better be it. Of course, you will learn, hopefully learn more than that. Um, but genes control development is like the number one thing that you should appreciate after taking this course. Okay, and I am really running out of time. Um, the next set of slides um, are, are talking about how genes development and evolution are linked. Okay, so um, this is something you'll talk about more in the latter half 
of this course in part two with Professor Near is evolution. Um, and it, I think for now, it'll suffice it to say that changes in the genes that control development, right? They can have these profound changes on the form and function of an organism. And therefore any mutations or any, you know, changes to those genes that are very important for development could also have profound changes on the evolution of that population of organisms. Okay. So I think I'll bring this up later again. Um, but here's an example of Darwin's finches. You may have heard of this scientist named uh, Darwin, and he studied um, finches uh, along with a lot of other organisms. He, um, along with other scholars at the time, came up with this theory of evolution. Um, here, what I'm pointing out is that there are finches. These are the beaks of various different finches. Um, they have different shapes and sizes. And the point here is that we now know that this is the result of differential expression of a protein called BMP. So this large ground finch here with this arrow, this red arrow pointing to it has a lot of this black shading here um, in these images to the right. This is showing uh, the expression of BMP, right? It's much darker than all the rest of these images here. Um, and, and that is thought to contribute to the larger size of this beak here of the large ground finch. And we'll talk about that more later. I'm gonna skip over this. Okay, any questions so far? I'm gonna to start to kind of get to the end here. <laughs> so this I'll stop for questions for, for a moment. Okay, cool. Um, and this concept of evolution is obvious. This is gonna be something that Professor Near talks about extensively in his portion. Um, and, and so here, what this, this, this is a phylogenetic tree. This is a, a tree of life here. Um, and we call this a phylogeny or a tree or a phylogenetic tree. You can see all these branches coming off of it. Right, we see some nice color coding here with three colors. We see yellow for bacteria, we see red for archaea, we see blue for eukarya. These are the three domains of life on earth. Um, and we see a lot of branches coming off in the eukarya domain. Um, but if importantly, the point I'm trying to make is if we go in this direction, back this way, right? We see all of these branches coalescing to one connected point here at this node, that's what we call a node, at the base of this tree. So what do you think that is? What's happening at this node here? What is that? What's the significance of that? The first um, origination of life, maybe? Yeah, exactly. So our, our origin is shared, right? That's the point of this slide. All life on earth is related. And that is because we have a common ancestor and that common ancestor being indicated here by this node, right? So you'll learn how to read this phylogenetic tree and interpret phylogenetic trees later on in the second portion. But um, the point is here is that all life on earth is related. We all came from a common ancestor, which was a unicellular organism. Okay, um, we are located somewhere within this branch, right? We are technically an animal. So we're here in the eukarya domain in the animal branch here. Um, okay, and so importantly, the relatedness of life on all earth is a very important concept that I hope you will appreciate in this first portion. In the second portion, you'll get to appreciate the, the diversity of life, um, but because we share a common ancestor, we share uh, a lot of commonalities. Um, and, and, and so that is the unifying principle of all life on earth. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over this next slide here. Skip, 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 skip. This is actually Darwin's, um, Darwin drew his own phylogenetic tree um, in his own notebook, okay. So this is an, an old version of one, again, showing the relatedness of all life. So this was something he was definitely thinking about. 
Okay, so um, all right now, whoops, this slide is poorly animated. Um, so I'm gonna skip over this. All right, so here we have some organisms. To study developmental biology, we, we rely on using some organisms called model organisms. Um, and in this course, and I'll talk about this in a moment, you're going to be writing a proposal as a part of your homework. And um, in that proposal, you'll propose some sort of model organism to us that you would like to use in your study. Um, and this is because as scientists, we utilize model organisms to to basically understand how we develop, right? The process by which we develop, what is happening when we observe developmental um, abnormalities, when something goes wrong during, during development, uh, what is happening when we experience um, an ailment or some sort of disease or cancer, for example, how is, right? We use these model organisms to be able to understand these processes in humans, right? Why, why is it that we don't necessarily just directly use humans to understand how we work? What do you guys think? Well, I mean, there's like a couple of reasons, but an example from the book was um, a heterozygous gene expression and how like a dominant allele could automatically trump a recessive allele, even though like a human might be a carrier and also that human life cycles are so long. Yes, okay, so um, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about the genetics um, of humans, why that might make it difficult to study humans, but um, at this level here, right, it's, it's hard to study humans because, well, first of all, um, we have a very long, uh, life cycle compared to these organisms here that I'm showing. Um, our reproduction cycle is long, right? We have a nine month, um, you know, it takes nine month, months to develop a, a child, right? Whereas for some of these organisms, it could be just a matter of days, right? So you can quickly make a lot of, um, of these um, organisms to further your studies. Right? Can anyone think of any other reasons why, why it, would it be um, nice to study a fruit fly, for example? A lot of these experiments would just be pretty unethical if conducted on humans. Like if, if you want to tag a certain cell that to, to observe its development, you, I think there will be a lot more objections to doing that in an embryo than in a fruit fly, for example. Right, ethical concerns, definitely. Ethical is huge. Um, there's also costs of money. Some of it is impractical. Impractical, yeah, and why is that? Um, like you said, in terms of money, but also in the sense that like, it may take a long time for humans to present symptoms for diseases, but like in some kinds of cancer, if you do it in a mouse, it, it presents itself incredibly quickly. Right, exactly. That's really great. Um, yeah, costs a lot of money. It might be impractical, um, ethical concerns if you use humans, um, right? These organisms here, um, they're very manageable to work with in, in the lab. Um, they take up you know, not very much space. They're cost effective. Um, we know a lot of, about them already. Um, these, like for example, the Xenopus, um, a lot of the earliest developmental experiments um, were, and observations that were made were made in, in Xenopus. And so we know a lot about these, um, these organisms here. And so they're very useful. Um, so the point is here is that we use model organisms to understand how we work. Um, they, and, and these model organisms are strategically chosen because they adapt well to laboratory situations for study, right? They're very amenable to laboratory study. And um, we, what we learn from them, we can apply it to us for the most part. And why is that?
all organisms have the same DNA structure? Yeah, so we, sh we, share, we share a lot in common, right? So not only do we share um, genes in common, and thus not only do we share protein sequences um, and other molecules in common, but we also share a lot of developmental processes in common too. Um, so just to give you a sense of this, all right, some food for thought here, um, uh, right? Obviously the, the chimp, we are uh, very closely related to the chimp. So we share about 99.5% of our, our genetic material is shared with the ch uh, chimp, right? Um, even less so for mice and even further less for chickens, um, fruit flies. We, we actually share 60% of our genetic material with fruit flies, right? I don't know if that's surprising to you. Certainly surprising to me, right? We look so different, but yet 60% of our genome is, is conserved. That's what we call conserved. So let's talk a little bit about conservation and then I'm gonna go to logistics and I'm gonna fly through logistics. And I'm sorry I didn't take a break today. Um, okay, so here we're looking at a sequence of a gene, PAC6. Okay, so we have mice, the sequence at the top. Then we have flies, a shark and a squid. Right now we're comparing, we're aligning this sequence. Um, and for the fly, it's, it's called something, it's called eyeless because um, the fly people, people who study flies, they have a unique naming system for their genes. So um, even though it aligns um, with PAC6 and we call it PAC6 in the mouse, right? Different people, discovered this gene and named it something else at that time. Okay, so that's why it's named something here differently, but this gene is, is, is controlling the development of the eye or it's important for the development of the eye in both mice and flies. Okay, so here, since we're comparing the gene sequence, we're looking at nucleotides. So you see GTs, As, and Cs all in a string, all in a row. Um, and, and for these three sequences here, the blue is indicating that at that position that that nucleotide matches that of the mouse at the top, right? So we see a lot of blue here. Okay, some differences obviously, but much of it is, is shared and we call that con conservation. So much of that sequence is conserved. So here we have a conservation in nucleotide sequence. Okay, and why is that important? So we're gonna get to that. That's gonna be the last point that I make here. So here, a question for you. Do you think it's possible to use yeast as a model organism? So that wasn't one of the ones that I had on the previous slide, um, but could we use yeast as a model organism? What do you think? Quick, someone shout out yes or no. What do you think? I think you could. You could. Yes. yes, you could. All right. So even though these, this is Professor Near, by the way, um, this is yeast. Um, even though these two organisms look very different, um, they are uh, related at the molecular level, right? And so here we're looking at um, the alignment of this, uh, of RAS, okay? And actually I can't quite read it, um, but I believe the second um, line is humans and the last line is yeast, right? So we're comparing the sequence for this RAS protein here. Rather earlier, I showed you a nucleotide sequence alignment. Here I'm showing you an amino acid sequence alignment. For, so we're not looking at A, C, Gs and Ts anymore. We're looking at those single code um, amino acids, right? So there's all these different types of letters, right? Because we have 20 different amino acids. Um, but essentially, if you just compare the human and yeast sequence of RAS, this protein, it's very similar, right? Okay, why is this important? Why is having a, a conservation of sequence important? What does that suggest? Um, well, it's, it suggests a conservation in function, right? Because as you learn from 101, sequence determines the structure, structure determines the function of that molecule. So if you have a similar sequence, then you probably have a similar function 
of that protein. And in fact, in the case of RAS, you do. So RAS is this gene with this particular function. I'm not gonna go into it right now, um, but when you have yeast that do not have this RAS gene, they die. But if you then give, give those yeast that are now lacking their own endogenous RAS gene, if you now give them um, a piece of DNA that encodes the human RAS gene, now you can what we call rescue them, right? Now the cells will live. So what does that tell you? Well, that the conclusion here is at the bottom. The human version of that RAS gene can substitute for the yeast version. There's both sequence and functional conservation. Okay, this is something we'll definitely talk about more, um, but I now have just a few moments to go through all the logistics, okay? So I'm gonna do that now. Okay, you have a quiz. Your first quiz is due on Wednesday, okay? So we're gonna talk about this more tomorrow. Every two lectures, you're going to have a quiz, okay? And that quiz will just be over the preceding two lectures. The format of the quiz, as you'll see for the first one, the first quiz is not time, okay? So you'll have plenty of time to get familiar with the format, so don't be too nervous about it. You're gonna have some matching, you'll have some true, false, multiple choice, and then you'll have a couple, maybe one or two short answer type questions from the two lectures that I gave preceding it, okay? They will always be due at 10, 15 in the morning before uh, the next lecture, okay? So here I will um, always have a slide here at the end of my lectures to sort of point out, um, to give you hints about what you should study for your quiz, okay? So read through that on your own time. Um, I will also have kind of this heavy slide here with key concepts, okay? Read through this on your own time, okay? This is all the main points, the key concepts that I want you to get from the lecture. You may have seen this slide before. At this point, um, you should be familiar with some experimental approaches, especially if you came from 105 with Professor Musiker. You should, um, know the format of a scientific paper, how to read a paper, um, understanding different processes of analyzing and interpreting data, right? In, in this course, one of the main things we're going to build off here is now designing and writing a research proposal. Um, and I will talk more about this on Wednesday, okay? So for your later homeworks, homework two through five, you will be, um, you will be writing a research proposal, okay? We won't have any exams. There are no midterms. There are no exams. Um, there are only quizzes and there's only homework. So you will have 12 quizzes in the total of the five weeks altogether, right? Six for my half, six for Prof Nier's half. And that's going to be 50% of your grade. Um, you'll be able to drop the lowest score from each part. So from my part, you'll be able to drop one quiz. From Prof Nier's part, you'll be able to drop one quiz. Okay. Um, and that's going to be every two lectures. And I believe that's going to be the same format for Prof Nier. These quizzes, and I will emphasize this again tomorrow, they're closed book, they're closed note, no Google search, searching, right? You only have, you're only going to have, with the exception of this first quiz, 30 to 45 minutes per quiz. Um, that should be enough time, right? But if you're searching through your notes or searching through Google, that's not gonna be helpful to you, right? So the goal is for you to come prepared to your quiz, right? Um, and again, the first one is due Wednesday. They're all gonna be on Canvas um, and they're gonna be accessible at the same place where you can um, access the get to know you survey, which I hope you'll fill out once I unlock it at the end of lecture. All right, homeworks, briefly. Um, we're gonna talk way more in depth about this on Wednesday. Um, uh, but in the end, at the end of this two and a half weeks, um, you'll be writing a, a four page double spaced paper, right? Four pages, double spaced, that's not too bad, right? Um, the purpose of the homework assignment overall, right? The first one, um, which will be due tomorrow morning, okay? is just to become familiar with some of the online search engines and databases, some of uh, the databases like PubMed, um, which have scientific articles for you to explore and read through. 
Um, so this is just walking you through how to use it. Okay, this assignment is really mostly plug and chug. Um, so unless you're having issues with a particular particular link, if a link is broken or um, if if one of these databases is down, that's the only problem I can think that you might run into. If you do run into issues, just email me. Okay. Um, and we'll talk more about homework two through five uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Okay. But overall, you're you are writing a research proposal to focus on the role of a gene regulated by a transcription factor in a disease or developmental process. Okay. And we will talk about transcription factors soon. Okay. So don't worry too much about that now. This is a calendar, it's up on the canvas. Um, I really encourage you because we're, it's so fast paced, this is so condensed. We have lecture every day. We have assignments due every other day, it seems like. Um, take a moment to just look at it and orient yourself to it, okay? So this is just a reminder that that's there. Take a moment to look at it. For the most part, um, all your assignments are due at 10.15, the morning that it's due, except uh, with the exception of homework five. That's gonna be due a little bit early at 8.15. Don't worry about this now, I'll talk about this more later, okay? Importantly, late homework assignments will not be accepted for credit, okay? So make sure you turn things in on time. And that's just due to the fast nature of this pace or fast pace nature of this course. I'm starting to not be able to talk, okay. All right. We have our teaching scholars who I introduced earlier. They will be leading your sections. They will be grading your proposals. Okay, lastly, participation here. It's all um, based on your attendance to lecture and your uh, attendance and participation in lecture activities and discussion sections, okay? Your discussion section, you will be reading a paper. It's all gonna be journal club style. So we'll have two sections. So you'll have two papers to read. This first discussion section is Thursday. Okay, so I'll remind you about that. Um, but you'll be reading this paper here by you at all. It's already up on the canvas if you'd like to take a peek. We have Ed Discussions, which is this online platform to submit questions anonymously. I already have a thread started there. Post if you would like to respond to this Professor Challenges the Class question. I also have to keep us organized uh, a module page. So for every lecture, I will, I will include the slides here. I will include any movies that I include in those slides and just some re final reminders, right? So if you're completely lost on what to do, go to the modules page. And if you need any additional help, don't be afraid to ask for it, okay? So just email me. Here are some um, other suggestions for you to look over if you feel that you are struggling. Okay, I'll post all of this. Okay, so make sure to look over this. To sign up for office hours with me, there is a link on the Canvas page. Okay, so you actually, for my office hours, you sign up for time. I will have them Mondays and Wednesdays, 5.30 to 7.30, and Fridays, 1 to 2.20 in 20 minute increments. Okay, so you sign up for time. No office hours this evening, however, okay? Um, and to have office hours with our teaching assistance, you join via the Zoom tab on Canvas. You just drop in, right? So no sign up necessary, just drop in. And they will be on Tuesday and Thursday, one to three. Okay, starting tomorrow. Okay, so I'm over two minutes. Any questions, feel free to stay behind. Um, otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow. You should now in your inbox have a link to the first homework assignment. Um, so get started on that and I will see you tomorrow. Wait, I can throw in a pitch real quick. For anybody yeah. looking for a lab in the fall, I'm looking for an uh, undergrad to join me in my lab and others in my lab as well. So if anybody's interested in doing genetics or neuroscience research, my lab does that. Um, my email's in one of the PowerPoint slides. Um, no experience necessarily uh, needed right now. Um, you, you'll be with us and we'll teach you everything you need to do. Uh, so if anybody's looking for a lab and interested, um, let me know and I'll talk to you then. Awesome. Okay. Well, you're, everyone is free to go unless you have questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, for homework one, we just turn in the answer template, right? Like the one we write your answers in, right? Yep, write your answers in the template and submit it via Canvas. Exactly. Right. Thank you.